Welcome to another Infographic Instant with Brian Michael. In this episode, we'll be arguing for the case why next-gen or next-generation development banks need to be more Blackstone than World Bank. Specifically, these next-generation development banks need to focus much more on equity, private equity, or the public offering of equity than traditional debt-based financing and putting economies like the IGAT economies under increasing amounts of debt. The theme for this group of figures focuses on the China Development Bank model as slightly tweaked for the IGAD region. The six figures that we're going to show in this infographic argue against the debt-based approach and more for the sale of securitized assets which are then sold to the public as we describe in our paper. Theme 1 from this series argues that the IGAD economies can never repay the debts they currently have and thus it is unrealistic to expect them to receive more debt. Figure 21 shows the debt burdens in the IGAD region as a percent of gross national income and imports. So in that way we can see the size of these debts relative to the earning capacity of these economies to pay off these debts. In many cases, the debts are so large as to seem that they would be defaulted upon at some point in the future. The black part of the bar charts shows this debt as a percent of gross national income and we see that simply in percentage terms the debt is largest for Djibouti and relatively large for the Sudan. As a percent of exports we see that these debts are highest for Eritrea, Sudan again and Ethiopia. Therefore suggesting that even if these economies became much more export oriented they still wouldn't generate enough resources in order to pay off the loans that they already have. In the next figure we show that even if more debt lending was to occur in the IGAD region such investment would occur in clumps and focus on particular IGAD economies probably neglecting other ICAD economies. So we see in front of us for each of these economies lending and foreign direct investment before the global financial crisis and after the financial crisis. We see two trends in these data. First that some of these economies already had uh, more foreign direct investment than others and second both lending and investment reacted to crisis in some countries much more than others. The IGAD region will see crises in the future and therefore looking at their response to past crisis is one of the best ways of anticipating their response to future crises. And so for the economies you see in front of you we would expect that these economies would remain far more fragile to crises, therefore being less viable candidates for debt-based finance. If the IGAD region wants to promote investment as a block, as a unit, then methods must be devised to pool or aggregate investments and sell them as tranches or packets to investors such that even these less attractive economies would still receive part of the investments going into the overall IGAD region. The third theme of this series looks at the ability of lenders to recoup their investments in the IGAD region. In previous infographics we talked about the twin constraints for development finance, namely that they have to help these economies but at the same time generate enough profits for the banks to find it worthwhile to give the money. 
As we show in this figure, in many of these economies, the return on equity for banks making loans in these economies is extremely low and almost certainly less than the risks that these banks have had to bear. The bars in this figure look at return on equity, whereas in the black boxes look at the return on assets. Overall, we see that the return on assets has been under 5% for all of the IGAD economies where we could find the data. And in some cases like Ethiopia, even Uganda, the return on equity has been relatively high. But in some cases, such as in Uganda and Kenya, the cost to income ratio has also been very high. So that banking inefficiencies would prevent these banks from using relatively large interest rate payments in order to earn a profit and generate the resources for future lending. And so because we see that national banks in these economies have been unable to generate enough profits in order to create a sustainable banking sector, it's very doubtful that any kind of lending in this region would generate enough resources in order to serve as a sustainable source for finance in this region. The fourth theme of these figures focuses on debt overhang in the region. Not only would lending in this region be problematic for banks in that they wouldn't get their money back, but even those institutions that have lent money in the past, they still have not received payment and probably won't receive payment in the future. The figure in front of you shows multilateral debt as a percent of total debt in these IGAD economies. And we see that for Uganda, Eritrea, Djibouti, these debts are easily 50% or over in terms of total lending. And even when they're not high as a proportion of total debt, their absolute value is relatively high, such as in Kenya coming in at $5.4 billion, or Uganda coming in at $4.2 billion, and Ethiopia coming in at $5 billion. Of course, the Sudan takes the prize owing $25 billion. Thus, the first step that these IGAD economies need to take before getting any kind of finance in the future is to resolve these past loans that have been extended to these economies. The benefit of a securitization equity model that we propose in our paper is that it's much easier to resolve debt overhang and to pay off past lenders by giving them shares of productive assets rather than by simply swapping debt from previous generations for debt on future generations. The fifth theme in this series of figures focuses on the political clout and the economic power needed to counterbalance the anti-investment policies of the governments in this region. We've seen in the past that traditional lending and advice from the Bretton Woods institutions like the World Bank and IMF, they have not been able to exert enough pressure on these countries' governments in order to adopt the regulations that they need in order to repay the loans that these institutions have given. Thus, the challenge for any kind of financier in the future is not only to provide money which can help grow these economies and generate a profit, but also to exert enough influence over these governments such that they adopt the policies which will allow these financiers to generate the profits they need in order to keep extending finance. So the figure shows, by way of illustration, the cost of starting a company in these economies as one proxy for the difficulty of doing business in these economies. We see that for the South Sudan, Djibouti, and Ethiopia, the cost of starting a company is 100% of gross national income per person or above. The figure also shows the ease of doing business rankings, and you listeners are almost certainly familiar with these data from the World Bank. 
what these figures show is that the business environment in many of the IGAD countries is the worst out of all the countries measured by the World Bank. So South Sudan has a rank of 186, whereas in Eritrea has a rank of 189. So the way to interpret this ranking is that in 189 economies, it's easier doing business than it is in Eritrea. Therefore, without some kind of external influence to help raise these ease of doing business rankings and to militate for policies that lower costs of starting a company and other business regulations, it's unrealistic to expect that any kind of investment finance in this region would have any kind of impact. The sixth and last theme in this series again focuses on the need for lobbying for change. What we see in this figure using again different regulations, in this case the strength of minority protection and the cost of enforcing claims against companies, is that the strength of this protection is too weak and the cost of chasing claims is too high. Specifically, the Sudan ranks 163 in terms of its strength of minority protection, Djibouti 171, and Kenya 137. Again, interpreting these scores means that in the case of Kenya, 137 economies have stronger minority protection regulations than Kenya does. Looking at the flip side of the figure, we see that almost all of the IGAD economies have extremely high costs to chasing claims. Ethiopia ranks 154th out of all the World Bank surveyed economies for this cost. The Sudan 174, Eritrea 166, and you can read the rest of the figures for yourself. So stepping back and looking at these trends in general, we see the IGAD economies rank among some of the worst countries in the world for doing business and thus without some kind of external influence it's very unlikely that any kind of development finance in the future will have any growth oriented impact. This has been another Infographic Instant with Brian Michael.